Welcome to this exclusive Portfolio Construction Forum presentation. Economic growth is the answer, not the problem. Dr. Oliver Hartwich, Executive Director of the New Zealand Initiative, Wellington. This presentation was recorded in Auckland on 19th of May as part of Portfolio Construction Forum Symposium 2015. In the past, I've spoken to you about uh, the global economy. I've talked about Europe. I've talked about capitalism. Today, I'm talking about a book. And this is the book, The Case for Economic Growth. I'm glad you're all still here, of course, because uh, after the previous session, I thought you might have all gone to the beach. But you obviously want to hear about economic growth. And this is the book that we just published about a couple of months ago at the New Zealand Initiative. The book is actually uh, kind of reminiscent of uh, Monty Python in a way. At least that's what it says on the back cover. And no, it's not, uh, don't mention the war. And that, and that was <laughs> faulty towers anyway. Um, but has anyone seen here uh, Monty Python's Life of Brian? Perfect. In which case, you would all know this question. Or it would sound very familiar, at least. Apart from longer life expectancy, better health, improved education, a cleaner environment, better opportunities for our children, and a happier country, what has economic growth ever done for New Zealanders? <laughs> that was the question we asked. Now, you might say that writing a case for economic growth is a little bit like tilting at windmills, because who would be against it? We launched it at a dinner for the New Zealand Initiative with Bill English. And Bill English spoke about it, and he said pretty much as much. He said, well, I don't really know why I'm speaking about a book making the case for economic growth, because aren't we all for it? I mean, we may disagree, and Labour might have different ideas on how to promote it, and how to push it, the national, and the Greens are certainly on a completely different planet. But in principle, at least, wouldn't we all want to see growth happening in the economy? Well, as Bill English spoke, we put it out on Facebook. We've got a large Facebook followership, of course, for the New Zealand Initiative. And we just thought, well, let's just celebrate. We've got a new book out, and it makes the case for economic growth. We were flooded with abuse. You wouldn't believe it, but people said, well, a typical right-wing think tank stuff. They would be for growth, wouldn't they? Um, and we really thought, well, should it really matter whether you're left-wing, right-wing, center, socialist, capitalist? Isn't economic growth a good thing? And we were really puzzled and surprised by the reactions we got on the publication. But then again, maybe we weren't that puzzled at all after all, because that's kind of what we expected. And this was really the motivation why we even wrote this in the first place. Well, actually, I asked two of my colleagues, Eric Crampton and Janice Jerem, to write this book for us, because my impression was that there was something not quite right. And maybe that's just my personal impression, not just in New Zealand, but in other parts of the world as well. I previously lived in Australia, in Britain, and I, you would never guess it, of course, I come from Germany. Um, in all these countries, I have detected a deteriorating enthusiasm for economic growth. I was born in the mid-70s in Germany, that's where I grew up. And I'm a bit of a techie anyway, so I always liked growth, I liked new technologies, I liked when stuff was happening. But I soon realized that I was becoming the minority. And what happened, I think, especially when I think of my own childhood and youth in Germany, was that increasingly got these negative stories about economic growth. And typically, with a bent on the environment, referring back to uh, some environmental disasters and some technological disasters. And I think the one thing, the one event that really questioned the whole growth narrative in the European case was Chernobyl when this nuclear power station blew up in the Soviet Union and the fallout came over and we couldn't actually harvest stuff anymore for a few weeks because we had the fallout there in our gardens. Around the same time, the Germans got very concerned about the dying of the forests. There were forecasts in the early 1980s that by the mid-1990s there would be no forest left in Germany and all the trees would have died because of acid rain. Then we had years when we had a few um, chemical disasters and um, they polluted some of our rivers. So in one of the years, there were practically no fish left in the River Rhine because of that. And so there were a lot of these environmental concerns, global warming, of course, um, that caused people to rethink whether economic growth was a good thing. And not just that. We then had an, a second wave of growth skepticism in the 1990s, and I think that was felt certainly beyond Germany, beyond Europe, also here. And that didn't focus that much on the environment anymore. It focused on something completely different. It focused on happiness. So people were arguing that, yes, you may all care for GDP growth, but really, why? Does it really make you any happier if an economy grows? 
And shouldn't we just look at some other examples, maybe Bhutan, some esoteric countries where they've apparently found a formula to make everybody happy even though they will stay poor? And you may remember that at the time, the French president, Nicolas Sarkozy, actually even put together a commission to really investigate how a gross um, happiness index could look like for France. I always thought that Nicolas Sarkozy was just doing it because he didn't have any growth figures to report. But um, anyway, for France, that might have been an alternative um, uh, that was quite attractive. So that was a second wave of growth criticism. And then we recently had a third wave. And the third wave of growth criticism was, yeah, yeah, okay, maybe it doesn't quite damage the environment as much as we thought, and maybe it still makes you kind of happy, but there's inequality. And the whole of last year was, of course, dominated by Thomas Piketty and his book Capital in the 21st Century. So Piketty basically makes the case, yes, the economy is growing and capitalism probably delivers, but at what expense? basically at the expense of the poor. So we might get some economic growth, but it flows to the 1%. So he was basically making the academic argument for the Occupy Wall Street movement that we had a few years um, earlier. So really, we had economic growth attacked from all sorts of uh, different corners. We had the environmental critique, we had the inequality critique, we had the happiness critique. And of course, you can really go back into history and you can find very similar arguments being made really from ancient Greek times. You can see that there were some philosophers back then who were extremely critical of growth. You can see it in Roman philosophy. You can see it in the 1960s with um, Eric Schumacher's um, book, um, Small is Beautiful. You can see the Club of Rome and uh, their growth skepticism where they said, well, growth in a finite planet cannot be infinite. But all of this really took up speed in the 1980s and 90s and in this century now where we're getting more and more growth skepticism. So, I thought, is it true? And the beautiful thing about running a think tank is you can actually ask your colleagues to look into these issues, and that was the result. So what my colleagues, Eric and Janessa, did was they went through a whole range of statistics and just looked at the empirical facts. Does growth really damage the environment? Does it make us less equal? Does it make us less happy, more unhappy? And actually, if you're going through all the different statistics, what you find is actually the answer is typically no, it doesn't. Growth is good. Well, that's another movie quote in a way. So let's just go through these topics one by one. When we first talk about growth, we should probably be clear what we mean, GDP. Now GDP, of course, admittedly, is not an ideal measure of economic progress because some of the stuff that we care about gets never reflected in GDP figures. So. Um, GDP really only measures what is sold in the economy and what government produces. Now we know that that's not a quite adequate measure sometimes because not everything that government produces actually adds value. But that's the only chance we have to include government activity in economic growth figures. And just to give you a very practical example, some stuff only gets measured when it's paid for, whereas if you do it yourself, it doesn't get measured. If I make my breakfast at home and I make my own sandwich, that doesn't enter GDP figures. If I go to a cafe and get the same sandwich over there, I pay for it and it gets measured as GDP. And so a lot of the stuff that we care about in the economy, for example, when we um, deal with um, families, when um, mothers raise their children, for example, and stay at home for a few years, that is valuable, of course, but it doesn't get measured. So there are some problems with GDP and I'm the first one to admit that. Having said that, it is still a useful shortcut to understanding what's going on in the economy. And you can realize how useful a shortcut it is when you actually put GDP and combine it with different other social outcomes. And you can look at it on a website called Gapminder where you just put GDP figures next to other socially desirable outcomes, education results, life expectancy, immunization rates, whatever you want you kind of compare how GDP correlates with these other outcomes, and what you typically see is that an economy that produces higher GDP rates, higher GDP growth rates, typically does better on all these other measures as well. And that's a great thing. So in a way, yes, we can admit GDP is perhaps not quite perfect, but it is a shortcut to understanding what's happening in markets. It is a shortcut to understanding what's happening in society. And typically, from all the empirical evidence that we see, it is pretty clear, rising GDP is a good thing because with rising GDP come all sorts of other things. We get better education results, we live longer lives, we live more fulfilled lives, we just get better at a whole raft of social 
things that we care about. Now, to the three main criticisms about the environment, about inequality, about happiness. If we talk about the environment first, um, I'll give you one very practical example. When the United States and Mexico negotiated about a free trade agreement between the two countries, there were opponents of the free trade agreement in the United States arguing that this would be a complete disaster for Mexico because Mexico in the end would just pollute the environment. All sorts of polluting activities of US companies would be outsourced to Mexican companies and in the end, yes, they might get some economic growth in Mexico, but at the end of it, Mexico would be a polluted country. Some of that actually happened, but maybe just for a couple of years, because what typically happens when it comes to economic growth and the environment is what economists call a Kuznets curve. What it means is that things first get a little bit worse before they get a lot better. And how this works is, in the case of Mexico, that you outsource a lot of production, and yes, you created some negative environmental consequences. But then the locals actually demanded, with rising incomes, that the government takes better care of the environment. And they just demanded better regulations. They demanded stricter environmental controls. And this is what's then pushing governments to legislate for that. And so the stronger an economy grows in the long run, the cleaner the environment gets. And we can see this now uh, when we're looking at China. China, of course, has a massive problem especially with air pollution, but as China gets richer, as, as its people get more affluent, they will be demanding for a cleaner environment and therefore we can expect exactly the same development to happen in China as well. Economic growth is good for the environment. You compare my home country, look at what um, socialism did to East Germany where there was practically no growth for decades and how the environment was exploited and compared to, compared to West Germany where of course it wasn't perfect and you had occasional problems but there was enough income generated to actually mitigate these environmental problems. And so in the end, you got better results on both fronts. You get better economic growth figures and you get better environmental results. We believe there is a strong case to be made based on good empirical evidence that economic growth doesn't harm the environment. It actually helps us to protect it. So we think you don't have to be concerned too much about the environment. You don't have to be concerned about finite resources either. Because what we do, of course, in markets is we figure out which resources become scarcer over time. This is why we had the oil shock in the 1970s. Suddenly oil prices went up because the, um, there was more demand and less supply for oil. This is how markets deal with scarcity. So in our worldview, we really never run out of any resources completely because before we even run out, we would actually price these resources out of use. This is what economic growth also does. Now, when we talk about happiness, happiness is, of course, desirable. We all want to lead happy lives, but really, it is not that easy to measure. Typically, what happens when you measure happiness, you're asking people, how satisfied are you with your life? And then you give them a scale from zero to 10. And typically, people say, well, yeah, seven, eight. And that's the median answer in practically all of these surveys, no matter where you take them. First of all, you might just ask a few questions. Is it really that likely that if you are the happiest person on the planet and there's nothing wrong with you and you're really full of optimism, you would only be two notches above the median? That's not quite intuitive, I would say. And the other thing is actually you're taking a very static look at things because, I mean, what does it really mean being 8.5 happy or 5.6 happy? And how does it compare to how you were maybe a year ago, maybe 10 years ago. 10 years ago, you would have probably also reported that you were maybe seven and a half happy. And today, you're also seven and a half happy, but you've got an iPhone 6. Would you like to change? So in a way, we're comparing things that you can't easily measure. And what we see in all of these happiness surveys is that sometimes it doesn't really matter too much about you know, how the absolute level of happiness looks for you, but more the direction of travel. What I always find fascinating traveling to developing countries is that you meet people who are remarkably optimistic, who are really full of enthusiasm, who want to develop, and if that happens in economies that are on a per capita terms, or on per capita terms relatively poor but developing, you can see where this optimism is coming from. And then you travel to Western European countries, stagnating economies that are probably way richer on a per capita basis and have accumulated more wealth over time, but they've been stagnating for many years now, and you can see that actually that is determining how these people feel about themselves. 
So really, it is not enough just to measure happiness in absolute terms and just take it as a static thing. You have to look at the direction of travel, and this is the argument that we make here. We find that economies that grow actually have a, a population that is way more content with life. Economies that stagnate actually also risk political instability because once an economy stops growing, of course, what you do have to do is, as a politician, you have to kind of divide um, the pie and you have to slice the pie and actually redistribute what you've got, but you can't actually share the proceeds of growth, which is much nicer. And so you're creating winners and losers in a stagnating society and that creates a lot of discontent. So from a happiness perspective, we do not believe that there's anything to say against economic growth, which leaves us really with one last thing, and that's the inequality stuff. Now, Thomas Piketty, of course, had a lot to say about inequality. A lot of the data that he cites is American, and we think, well, first of all, there is a massive difference between New Zealand and America. You can't easily compare these two countries because, for example, and for a start, we do not have these big wage differentials between CEOs and average employees that we find in a lot of American companies, but we don't find them here, not to the same degree. So in a way, this whole inequality argument that we often hear doesn't quite apply to New Zealand as much as it does apply to the United States. And then we went through the data again and we had to look what economic growth actually did in the New Zealand case. And you might be very surprised to hear that from 1953 to 2011, for which we had data, the top 10 and top 1% of society became about 50% richer on average, which is nice. And then you realize that the bottom 90% actually doubled their income in real terms. So actually it is the bottom 90% that are doing a lot better rather than the top one or top 10%. So in a way that seems to suggest to us that we do not have the same kind of inequality problems in New Zealand and economic growth has actually benefited everybody. Um, you can look at it in completely different ways as well. Um, one of the best comparisons I have seen in recent times was at a conference in Hong Kong where an American professor just took us through a 1970s version of a Sears catalog. So a mail order catalog and he just um, explained, well, this is the kind of stuff that you could buy back then and this is how long it took uh, someone on the minimum wage to, to basically work for that and earn that. And then we did a product by product comparison what was a suitcase like in the 1970s? What is a suitcase like today? Not only did the suitcases, for example, become cheaper over time in the sense that you didn't have to work as long as you used to in the 1970s, but actually our suitcases were a lot better. They had wheels for a start. So um, they were a lot more durable. They were a lot more attractive. There were actually certain varieties now of suitcases you could choose from. So that's what economic growth also does. So when you're comparing inequality, keep in mind, not only is it not a problem that apply, does apply to New Zealand, keep in mind that actually even if you're relatively poor, if you're in the bottom 20% of society, you would probably still enjoy a way better standard of living than you would have in the 1970s. So we think if you're really looking through all of the evidence, and we have done that, it's really an entirely empirical report where we're just going through loads and loads of data. You can find that Growth doesn't destroy the environment, quite the opposite. We think it's the answer to environmental problems. Growth doesn't make us unhappy, quite the opposite. We think that actually growing faster makes you happier still. And growth doesn't cause inequality problems. Growth actually is something that helps us as a society for everybody, for everybody to get better, better off over time. But if that's the case, well, what do we do about it? We think we should celebrate growth and we don't have that culture in New Zealand, unfortunately. When uh, Robert asked you whether you want to go back to the beach or whether you're just satisfied with your life, I mean, I, I can sympathize with that because we've got a great quality of life. But still, I think we should become a lot more ambitious because growth is good. And if you're really thinking that you could stand still and just enjoy what you have, you're falling behind because other countries, other nations are probably just a little bit more ambitious and they will make our lives very hard and very difficult if we just let them reap the proceeds of growth and we'll just prefer to remain stuck where we are. So if we care about growth, we really have to talk about the policies that would make us grow f further. And in the last chapter of this publication, we had a quick look at the literature again, suggesting what are the basic settings that would make an economy grow faster. And there we are quite clear because we have very good evidence that strict property, strong property rights, an independent judiciary, strong um, economic and political institutions, lack of corruption, um, and of course, small government contribute 
to economic growth. We know, for example, from empirical research that as the government consumes 10% more of the economy, it typically slows down economic growth rates by between 0.5 and 1% per year, which of course adds up over time. So in summary, we think growth is good. We think it has done a lot for this country and we would like to see a lot more growth happening in the future. And with this publication and all the other publications at the New Zealand Initiative, we are contributing to this debate. Thank you for listening. For more information about Portfolio Construction Forum, Symposium and Symposium 2015 Resources Kit, please visit portfolioconstruction.com.au. Thank <laughs> you.